So all of the impulses behind the 40s and 50s pioneers, the impulse was to magnify sound, to put noise under a microscope, to integrate noise, and to edit sound as a collage. And this collage was all at the service of estrangement, at the service of defamiliarization. The key was to shock humans <coughs> into sonic consciousness, into an awareness of sonic matter, and to destroy the taken-for-granted assumptions and divisions between music, sound, and noise. So music concrete, I think, in those days was experienced as brutalism, it was experienced as a brutalist eruption into the cloistered architecture of the song form. If you could transfer processes of collage from the visual to the sonic, then this would mean that the concrete had a sonological purpose. Its purpose, of course, was to collapse art into life. The heroic drive, of course, was to organize everyday life and to become aware of the flux of life and its potential for creativity. If you fast forward a bit, by the time we get to the late 60s of the Beatles, Revolution No. 9, and the early 70s of Pink Floyd's, Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast, popular music integrates collage as an artistic project with these revolutionary ideals intact. In other words, pop music has a bit of an inferiority complex towards concrete. Concrete is very much importing revolution, and pop music is very much a servant that idea. Both Pink Floyd's audio excursions and Beatles' tape loops, tape loops, they were field trips into a momentary idea of revolution, which again was meant to wake up the pop audiences in their slumber. So with the invention of the sampler in the early 80s, and with the invention of the mini disc player in the early 90s, the whole project of music concrete kind of rise to a halt because recording everyday life, recording the urban field, becomes so simple that there's no longer any kind of aesthetic motivation at all. The sampler undercuts the difficulty of concrete. Remember John Cage and his team working on Williams Mix, working on city sounds and country sounds. It took them weeks to assemble these tiny elements of sound, to handle tiny material elements. And this was part of the heroic effort of modernism. Now the sampler and the mini display made this process as simple as the alphabet, made it as simple as breathing. And this kind of undercut the creative drive of music concrete, kind of disappeared from the musical landscape. At the same time, this is when electronic music turned towards an aesthetic of meta-musicality. If you remember the founding fathers of hip-hop, Grandmaster Flash and Electronics and Marley Mal, they turned towards an aesthetic of cultural recycling. They instigated a breakbeat ecology, an ecology of breakbeat in which the global sound archive was mined for grooves. So you had groove robbers and loop diggers toiling in the data mines, tracking the migration paths of vinyl as it flows across the planet. And then, in the early 90s and the late, mid to late 90s, new software emerges, new kinds of programming languages, new kinds of plugins, Super Collider, Metasif, Max MSP, and these demand an aesthetic of hard disk processing. Now producers could roam through the gigabyte wilderness of the hard drive. If you're working through digital signal processing, through granular synthesis, is what drives you. As we know, this atomizes sound into particles, into what Stereolab calls sound dust. So the sound dust is then what becomes your material for variable reconfiguration. So the musical landscape is dominated by two, maybe three main tendencies. First by metamusicality, cultural filtration, cultural recycling, second, analog synthesis, and third, hard disk formalism. And there's certain overlaps, of course. You can always name overlaps. But these overlaps, these exceptions, tend to confirm these main tendencies. And even though they're quite antagonistic, they all have in common 
a certain disdain towards the idea of using concrete, metamusicality, formalism, synthesis, all these ignore the idea that the world is a continuous composition with nobody conducting, that urban reality is all mixed and no master. So the return of music concrete in the music of producers like Herbert, like Matt Moss, like Bjork, like Moody Man, the return of music concrete is perplexing and fascinating. Matthew Herbert's <coughs> album from this year, Bodily Functions, includes these detailed liner notes for the compositional process of every track. And uh, track three, called Foreign Bodies, he explains that all the percussion is taken from bodily sounds donated by strangers and friends around the world. All the voices and digestion, he says, are by Dan Siciliano, the vocalist, and the blood of Martin Schmidt, who's one half of Mammoth. But what's the result of this endoscopic music. The result is gurgling, gelatinous, stuttering, microhouse. If you listen carefully, <clears throat> Martin Schmidt's pulsing blood flow makes you feel as if you are riding a microscopic submarine through the arterial networks, dodging flotillas of white corpuscles, moving aside clumps of cholesterol. So, I think we'll listen to this track. It's called Foreign Bodies for Matthew Herbert's album, Bodily Functions. And the key thing to listen out for, <coughs> as well as the vocal science <coughs> that percussion is created from, voice arrangements, is that all the syncopation, all the percussive elements are created from bodily functions. So the onomatopoeic function of inharmonic sounds of everyday life is organized. So let's have a listen to the biomechanical house of Matthew Herbert and uh, this is called Foreign Bodies.
40s or 50s, the pioneers, Schaefer and Henri, between that first wave of integration into the pop format of the Beatles and the Pink Floyd in the early 70s, and between now and the early zeros, defamiliarization through abstraction has instead become an index of bodily presence. Found sound has become an index of the vulnerable, the flawed, the unrepeatable. Essentially, music and credit has become a found sound humanism. Abstraction has become tempered by arrangement. Defamiliarization has been centralized by syncopation. The brute in musique concrète has been tamed by the forces of groove. And this is the key, I think. Producers like Herbert and Mathis, they generate an entire onomatopoetry, poetry, an entire menagerie of tones, of plutes and crickles and shaps and creaks and crunks and brutes and blurps and blaps. And they arrange all these until there's an unmistakable wiggle to the walk of the sound. There's a hint of bump and grind to music concrete. Essentially, music concrete gets its freak on. Mountains have, in fact, remixed Missy Elliott and Timberland's masterpiece. And this suggests that there's been a stealthy but significant break because, as we know, throughout the century, music concrete was all break and no flow. The composer Pauline Oliveros, she speaks for the avant-garde tradition when she says about rhythm, as soon as you get into a pulse pattern, you're locked into mechanical precision. And I think about what those time pulses really mean, which is locking people into certain kinds of things into work patterns which close off portals that might take you somewhere else. That's quite a classic idea of phobia towards rhythm, a recoiling from rhythm, which you can see in Stockhausen, in Cage. It runs throughout the entire 20th century. So what's happened is that the post-96 wave of producers, like Herbert's, and madness. They do three things. Firstly, they use the onomatopoeic qualities of found sound against the metal tradition of sampling. That's to say they use unmusical, inharmonic sounds for rhythmic and melodic purposes. At the same time, they use the rhythmic science of house, of two-step garage, of R&B, the start of programming, the syncopated offbeat. They use these against the tradition of concrete, which is always anti-rhythm. And finally, they use them against the compulsory dysfunctionality of Orteca-influenced electronic music, which is always convoluted beyond danceability. So there's a three-way maneuver which allows the new wave of producers to redeploy their sources against their tradition, to dislocate them from their procedures and to resituate them. Another key aspect is that producers like Bjork and Magnus are proud of their sources. Olivero says that if you identify in sound, then you're categorizing. And for the 20th century traditional avant-garde, as soon as sound becomes recognizable, then it's no longer abstract, of course. It's fallen away from abstraction. It's fallen back into figuration, back into recognizability. So you're not organizing sound anymore. You're assembling sound effects, special effects. You're Mickey Mousing. The new phenomenon not only identifies the source, but it tells narratives about them. It revels in it. It includes the location, the date, the time, the process of construction involves you in this documentary of accidental events of one of mistakes that are rescued and magnified. The frequencies and textures of chance are captured. 
and examine me under the microphone. And there's a racial dynamics to this identification of sources. Magnus described their sound as an incongruity between sound and genre. And you can really hear that, of course, because the way two steps slows down to a funereal, dragging, kind of dull, kind of one drop pattern. This incongruity between the sounds of medical procedure, which are at the service of the slow down two step gouge. But really, when they talk about the incongruity between sound and genre, that's a coy way of saying they're exploiting the incongruity between a white approach to sound, a white approach to art, and a black avant-garde approach to music. And what these groups are doing is making the indebtedness of collage to groove apparent. In other words, they plan musique concrète. They plug it back into social design. Musique concrète's tradition of anti-rhythm cuts it off from the mobility of social desire and freezes it, blocks it, by chopping up concrete into rhythm, as Matt must say. They reconcile listening with dancing. It's not that collage is all mind and no body, and house and R&B is all body and no mind, although you think that from the way people talk about it. But it's rather that all dance music is listening with all your muscles. We know that the entire body thinks. We know that the brain begins at the fingertips and ends at the toes. And music concrete, which turns into groove, has it both ways. It's simultaneously mind and body music because it's distributed music. The textures of the microsonic or at the service or groove. And there's a corporate implication to this. Uh, Matthew Herbert complained to Freeze magazine just last month. He was complaining that everyday life is saturated with corporate programming. He said, you get into a car, or you go into a shop, or you get on the tube, and there's music everywhere. You can't escape it. And this explains something peculiar about microhouse, or about the new phonography of house music. There's a peculiar sense of privacy to it. Even when it's played in clubs, I play some of this music in club in Lisbon called Looks. Huge place, giant speakers. You play these tracks and they still retain this peculiar privacy and thinness. Simultaneously, house music and hip hop and R&B are public music whether you play them at home or not. Micro house is private music whether you play indoors or outdoors. In other words, these producers have made some of music that opts out of the global flows of recorded music. They've made a sample of delicate music which has lost the sense of shared recognition, the sense of cultural filtering that hip hop has trained us in for the last 20 years. We've grown so used to this sense of cultural recognition of samples. Everybody's hyper aware, not just samples, but of processes through which samples are put. Everybody's ears are finely tuned. Everybody's absolutely perceptually aware of the tweaks and the takes and the spins that a sample goes through. It's something that defines the perceptions of a sampledelic era. And this music just opts out of it. It's sampledelia at the service of privacy. So you get a sense of microhistorical music. The science fiction writer J.G. Bauer wrote that science fiction should generate private time systems, eccentric chronologies, eccentric chronologies, idiosyncratic chronologies. And this is what this kind of music is. It's a private, it's a private time system circulating through acoustic space. We can define this privacy even closer when we remember that Bjork's album Vespertine was going to be called Domestica. And if you remember, Matmos created beats for Bjork's album from the sounds of ice cubes. Ice cubes being popped out of freezer trays, that cracking sound as the freezer trays bend in a plastic way. 
Herbert's previous album from 1998 was called Around the House. The title track, a beautiful track, integrated domestic sounds of him preparing breakfast, just like Alan Parsons, the engineer of Pink Floyd, in Alan's psychedelic breakfast 70 years before, 20 years before, in the early 70s. Except, of course, Matthew Herbert has much better grooves than Pink Floyd. And this is very important. This is the change. The seriousness and the respect with which grooves are taken, restfulness, collage, and the dead end of admiration. Clement Greenberg said back in the 50s, when the abstract expressionists were making their moves into the world stage of history, decided to go into battle against the French. He said, the expressionists have decided to go major, meaning that their work set itself to spar against the Parisian nouveau realists. And the concrete house producers that we've been listening to, they decided to go minor. They decided to go modest. They managed to turn house music, the most corporate expression of super club desire, Punctuation, punctual pleasure, the expected consensual pleasure of youth culture. They've managed to privatize it, to minoritize it. They turn the public languages of house and two step and R and B into private, eccentric, idiosyncratic musics. And simultaneously they've managed to syncopate this privacy, this electronic domestic music so that it matters to you. They manage to make you care about a tiny moment, a tiny flux of their lives. And the implications of this anti-corporate music is that sonologically anti-corporate without bearing any lyrical register of anti-corporation. They don't announce Matthew Herbert doesn't announce that his music is anti star It doesn't have to. Sonologically, it suggests a withdrawing from the corporate anticipation of desires. We know that humans are pattern-following animals. They create patterns. And this kind of music, this music made from music concrete and integrated with acoustic sounds, and integrated into a song form. This music becomes location sensitive, becomes location aware. If you look at your bank statements, after a while you can see a pattern emerging. There's a supermarket visit at the weekend, there's a visit to the ATM on Fridays, a red check every month, a haircut every three weeks. If you move house, the pattern breaks and scatters, and then very rapidly settles down again coagulates, you can really trace yourself taking the same routes over and over again to get to the same destinations over and over again. And it's very clear that these behavior patterns have become commodified. They become geodemographic patterns which corporations buy in order to anticipate your habit, in order to be waiting for you as you trace your same weary routine week in, week out. And this domestica, the domestica that you've been listening to, this private micro house, is a way of making the patterns of your life available to you as an audio map between the habitual nature of life and the opaque nature of local space between the self-scripted nature of your routine and the potentially accidental, there's an invisible map of location and awareness. You can see a parallel to this audio map in the installations of two artists in London at the moment, San Francisco artist Doug Aitken. He's got a piece at a certain time called New Oceans. And the English artist Mike Nelson, who has an installation at the ICA, it's called Nothing is Possible. Nothing is impossible. Everything is committed. And what both of these artists do is that they design fictional architectures. 
They design architectures that reconfigure the gallery space along the principle of partial disorientation. So instead of walking into the serpentine to see this mic, see this diaphragm piece, you find yourself being forced, obliged, to walk around the side of the building and down into the basement, at which point there's nothing to see except to go up another staircase opposite and then find yourself in the middle of the serpentine, which has been totally blanked out, it's very dark, and you're being guided by sound, being guided by the sound of dripping water, which is syncopated. And then what you see is giant installations, giant video pieces which are doubled and inverted, and reverted and turned on their side. Similarly, the Mike Nelson piece starts not in the front entrance of the ICA, but in the next building entirely, as if his architecture had to burst its borders and force its way out of its locations somewhere else. Both of these structures put function at the service of fantasy, and they generate a new sense of location by stepping down the line of sight and stepping up the line of tactility and audio. They're an enjoyably dislocating experience. We can say that between the abstract and the sensual, between the reassuring and the accidental. These kind of musics offer an audio map, an audio map of life lived in a moment of ambient fear. Ambient fear is what the theorist Brian Massoumi called the point where there's the potential for catastrophe at any point. He coined it in 1993 when he was talking about the capacity for catastrophe at every scale of material reality, whether it's the viral or the cellular or the dermal or the muscular or the local, the domestic, the urban, the national, the liquid, the planetary. At this point in ambient fear, audio maps which offer temporary reconciliations and temporary routes through the unstable nature of the local, the local which is simultaneously habitual and simultaneously accidental. These audio maps, I think, offer new possibilities for how to temporarily sustain ourselves. Okay, thank you.
come out of the trenches. Come get out of the trenches. You can run out. You will all be wiped out. The generals will be back, studying them carefully. That's the advanced guard, the infantry men, the first guys will be wiped out. They will transfer into this military trope into music. Kind of assumes a whole war scenario. And Herbert's kind of seceded from that. It's like there's no need for it. In a time of ambient fear, it's not necessary to shock. The potential shock is there. It's the generalized potential. It's really called it the generalized accident. It's potentially there from when you switch on your computer to when you open a letter. The potential of catastrophe is always there, so it's not necessary to shock anymore. People are wise to the seductions of defamiliarization. The key is to redispose the elements. And, um, the seduction is there, especially because, I mean, that track especially is trained you in how to listen to it. Um, a lot of dance to his lyrics. I wrote some of them down, and they were like, she said, not to stand, listen, hear yourself, somebody's neck, quicks, somebody's neck, someone's neck, quicks just here. It's a totally meta track. It was a track about listening to yourself. And it really gives you the tools. I mean, it's microsound, so it's really like close listening. It's close listening at the service of groove. The key is to have it all, not to be trapped in the dichotomy of serious, kind of unpleasurable, strict avant-gardism or total hedonism. So often when I go to give lectures, media centers, people have such a strict idea of avant-gardism, it's just bizarre. It's always based on industrial music. It's always based on punishing. This weird, sadistic idea, very hard idea of avant-garde music, electronic music, it's always as harsh as possible. The idea that you can seduce somebody <coughs> into a new perceptual adventure, it's always kind of off the, off the map. But I think it's totally feasible at this point. There's no need to engage in these old wars. You haven't been able to inherit these wars. They were necessary. It was necessary to fight these wars in 1920, but not now, I don't think. Anyone else? I just want to say I do recognize this expression. I recognize it as a similar. Yeah, I mean, when I wrote my book, More Brilliant Than the Sun, that was much more in tall to a classic idea of avant-gardism. It was much more about storming the barricades. <laughs> it was much more, but that's because um, mm-hmm. the nature of discontent at that point was much more pressing. Mm-hmm. Um, nature of discontent changes. Mm-hmm. It moves. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, I think it's... Um, now, I feel right now, I think it's brave to be solved. Mm-hmm. That's what I think. And that's what it's music. That's how I hear it, um, especially when it gives you the, the kind of tools for how to understand it. All you have to do is just listen closely, listen to the self, sound of yourself listening to it. It's very cagey. You remember Cage's idea of active listening. It's always a meta process. You have to listen to yourself listening. The key thing, of course, is that Cage would have hated the fact that his idea of meta listening was at the service of group. He'd have just had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> he just, just really, really called from it. He'd have been so unhappy. Yeah. But, um, but the idea that we can take active listening and place it at the service of something quite different. Mm-hmm. Um, it turned out that those guys the created a lot of cons- compulsory fear, which is kind of unnecessary at this stage. Um, and maybe it's only now that um, the young generation of producers that feel that have that just they listen to the world, they hear a plane of consistency, they hear complexity everywhere. There's complexity in R&D, there's complexity in house, there's, there's complexity in college. And the key is to very carefully combine elements. They don't hear hierarchies, they don't hear high and low, and these boring received ideas, which are really, really um, kind of leftover <coughs> games. They don't hear any of those, they're just what diverse at the time called a plane of consistency. It's just a smooth space. Everything is complex, and you just have to 
choose your elements very carefully, in quite soberly, kind of dry way, just very precise about your elements. And if you do that, then you arrive at something quite, something which scrambles these inherited power games of high and low, avant-garde and popular, commercial, and experimental. You really scramble these. That's very necessary. It's necessary to do them over and over again. Every time you think that battle's being won, it's back on. There's always somebody whose interests they are to re stratify sonic consciousness, which re satisfy, usually because in the name of social stratification, peer pressure, things like that. Any questions? Okay, well, Roland's making the key fun sound. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening to me.